morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for being with us today and welcome to our work cover webinar on secondary mental injuries. My name is Michelle Turton and I am the manager for mental injuries at Work Cover Queensland and I'm going to be your host today. Joining me remotely and you'll be able to see her shortly uh, is our guest presenter who will be co-presenting with me today and that's Tatiana Jockic uh, who will be formally introduced a little bit later on but also in the room with me I have the trustee tech support of Elise from our communications team uh, to help us move as smoothly as possible through the webinar today if you're listening now or, or as the recording progresses. Right. So before we begin, we'd like to acknowledge and pay our respects to the Yigara and Turrbal people as the traditional custodians of the land in which work cover meet with you today. We thank them and their elders, past and present, their ongoing connection to land, waters, culture and community. In particular, given the, the nature of the topic today, I'd like to acknowledge those listening with any lived or living experience of mental ill health distress or those who have been supporting people in their, net, in their support networks. So if you find any of the content today distressing or triggering, uh, Work Cover supports your decision to prioritise your wellbeing and self-care and rejoin us when you feel able to later in the session. Now onto some housekeeping for today. We will be recording this session and we'll later on send a link around along with the slide pack and a survey uh, to gather your feedback. Feedback is really important to continue uh, to improve and, and serve you with the information that you need. Uh, the recorded session will also be uploaded to the Work Cover YouTube channel via our social media. Please feel free to submit questions during the webinar using the Q&A button in the toolbar at the top of your screen. Uh, we'll do our best to answer your questions at the end of the webinar uh, and address some of those as this have, address those that have been submitted during the registration as well. Um, we're unable to answer uh, particular policy or claim related questions and we encourage you to reach out to your relationship manager if you have one on anything that's related to claims specifically or policy specific. And finally, if you have any technical issues, I'm glad I have Elise in the room uh, because probably not the person for you to come to, but please refer to the help information under the more button, which you will find in the toolbar at the top of the screen. So now I'd like to introduce to you today's guest presenter. Uh, Tatiana is a registered psychologist and managing director of JK Corporate Resourcing. She currently works in corporate health facilitating return to work programs and re rehabilitation. She has over 20 years experience as a psychologist working with individuals and organisations uh, during this period to assist people's well-being, wellness and reducing the risk of psychological harm, in particular working with complex psychological claims within the health sector. Uh, in particular, uh, Tatiana is part of our Return to Work Services panel um, and she has even been part of a pilot most recently where we've had her sitting side by side with some of our customer advisors, giving them some best practice informed claims guidance. So welcome, Tatiana. Good morning, everyone. Before we begin, I would like to remind our listeners that any information provided, including in response to questions answered here today by myself, Work Cover or Tatiana, is general information only and should not be taken as legal or uh, medical advice. I know I often get into a bit of story mode, so I think that sometimes that's the best insights I can give this audience is my almost 20 years experience at Work Cover Queensland, but it is quite anecdotal in some of its, in some of its aspects. Okay, so on the agenda today, we're going to go and look at what is a secondary mental injury in terms of a definition. Who is at risk? What can employees do to help at-risk workers? What can work cover do to help prevent the injuries? Secondary mental injuries and workers' compensation. We'll have some time for questions and some have been already sent through. And we'll have a wrap-up of some key takeaways as well. So... What is a secondary mental injury? A secondary mental injury and workers' compensation is any mental health condition that can arise later as a result of an initial work-related physical injury or illness. So secondary mental injuries may include conditions that some of you might be familiar with or have seen in your workplaces, such as adjustment disorders, anxiety, uh, depression, et cetera. 
So what do we mean by a secondary mental injury? Secondary mental injuries can stem from the impacts of initial work of an initial work-related physical injury, such as chronic pain or loss of function, or from the original workplace event that caused the physical injury, such as being involved in a traumatic event. We've outlined two examples, hopefully, just to make that um, uh, to, to aid that sort of comprehension, but I really would focus more so on the first one. And what we've outlined there as an example is Peter, who suffers an injury to his knee during the course of his employment. He has surgery on that knee and must stay off that leg while he's away from work for two months. Due to the surgery or the complications, Peter's recovery is delayed and he's unable to return to work until he's back to full function. So with no work and little routine and unable to play his weekly soccer game, I've added that in, at least I don't know if you saw that. I'd also add something in like he's just had a newborn baby or has a toddler who he plays a lot with and can no longer um, weight bear and, and lift that, the, you know, lift their new baby or their toddler. He's feeling unhappy and isolated. Okay, he attends his doctor and he would be possibly diagnosed with an anxiety or um, an adjustment disorder. The second example is one that uh, you also might be familiar with. Um, and due to how claims or in, how injuries present themselves to work cover, um, we add these as a secondary, uh, a secondary mental injury. But for those of you who might be familiar with an example, as I'll, I'll talk to the second one, we can appreciate that perhaps um, uh, a nature of a PTSD that comes on sometime after a traumatic event seems like it is secondary to that physical event, but probably, you know, obviously stems from that original workplace event or that traumatic workplace event, but just presents itself later. So in this example, Lily is involved in a truck accident during the course of her employment. Uh, she injures her back, has whiplash and concussion. Uh, perhaps there were other cars involved and other um, victims that she was um, were witness to or involved in that accident. She recovers from her physical injuries um, after a few or several weeks, but her memories of the crash and what was distressing about it keep playing upon her mind. And she's unable to sleep, um, she's unable to drive, or perhaps find access to the things that bring her joy in her in her life. And she might become quite, um, um, you know, withdrawn. She attends her doctor and might be diagnosed with symptoms related to PTSD. So there are a couple of examples. So um, we've come to a poll now. Uh, again, as I say, I have, I'm so glad I have Elise in the room with me, but we have a poll which I'm hoping everyone can engage in. Have you had an injured worker develop a secondary mental injury or struggle to cope emotionally following their physical injury um, at work? And I'll give you a few moments to answer that. And I'll just, um, so for anyone joining us from home that uh, doesn't have a Teams account, you will have to um, go up to the chat function, which is at the top of your screen, um, and uh, press on that chat function, and you should be able to see the poll um, in that chat function as well. Um, but yes, we'll give you a bit of time now um, to answer that one, um, and then we'll take a look at the results. Okay, we'll close that one off now. Um, so staggeringly, we've seen 85% say yes. Yes, they have seen um, or seen or had a worker develop a secondary mental injury um, and or struggle to cope emotionally after a physical injury. So 85% said yes and 15% said no for that one. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. It's glad to see a mix of people's experience come to the webinar. Obviously, those wanting to understand more about the topic, which is very admirable, and those wanting to learn um, ahead of something actually happening, happening which is very preventative too. Okay, so how um, common are secondary mental injuries? There have only been a few small studies looking specifically at the prevalence of secondary mental injuries in Australian workers. Uh, one study showed was conducted by Monash University in 2020 and surveyed a little over 3,000 Australian workers with accepted workers' compensation claims for musculoskeletal injuries affecting bones, joints and muscles and found that 38% of those workers reported either moderate to severe psychological distress. So at WorkCover, we have continued to see an increase in the number of secondary mental injury claims in recent years, and this upward trend is consistent with other jurisdictions. So what are some of the impacts uh, of these injuries? Uh, a secondary mental injury can have a significant impact on the worker's recovery and ability to return to work. 
Uh, the injuries can also create negative health, family, social and financial consequences for workers, and that can be difficult to diagnose and certainly treat as well. Secondary mental injuries could also significantly impact the duration and costs of a statutory claim and the conversion rate to common law, which can lead to higher premiums for employers. I suppose on that point within work cover, probably one of our most significant uh, and leading trends or emerging trends at the moment is the conversion rate to common law of claims that have a secondary mental injury component. Um, we predominantly, I think, as I talked to on the earlier slide, see a greater incidence or occurrence of secondary mental injuries on somewhat minor musculoskeletal injury claims. So let's take a look at some of the mental injury claim trends. We've outlined here a comparison of our mental injury claims as they are a proportion of our statutory claims. Um, mental injury claims, so just over or five and a half thousand, which is around 6% of our total statutory claims. Um, and also mental injury claims, um, I suppose, going to the next slide, uh, looking at costs um, are almost double that of a, um, a non-mental injury claim. And in terms of the average days off work, we're looking at 181 days compared to 72 days for uh, the rest of our cohort of claims. Uh, mental injury, the average cost per claim has increased by 10% from the previous financial year, and the days off work, that's an increase of 7.7% from the previous financial year. The return to work um, outcome for mental injury or secondary mental injury claims, um, both, is much poorer than those of our physical injury claims as well. So who is at risk? And I think for this, I'm going to hand over to lovely Tatiana. Thank you. Oh, Good morning, thanks. everybody. Okay, so what we're looking at from here is who is at risk? We know that there's an increase across all jurisdictions and workplaces. And so what we want to look at is what may increase a worker's risk of developing a secondary mental injury. So. Secondary mental injury risk factors. So the, so the key is the sooner we can identify who is at risk of developing a secondary injury, the sooner we can work to address and treat the psychological barriers and symptoms they're experiencing and ideally prevent the injury from developing. So what that basically means is the key is to identify the potential for that secondary claim. We need to be looking at, you know, what are the barriers? What are the psychosocial, the yellow flags? What's preventing that person from going back to work? And there are several risk factors that can make a person or a worker more vulnerable to developing a secondary mental injury. Some of them will be predisposing factors, meaning things that were present before the physical injury occurred and factors that emerge at the time or following a physical injury, including those specific to recovery, return to work and the claims process. So what this is really saying is we need to look holistically at that individual, even if what we're seeing we don't think is necessarily related to the original injury, we still need to be looking at what is the process um, that's or what's happening through the process that may be adding stress or anxiety to that individual's journey through workers comp. So secondary mental injury risk factors. Some of the things we need to look at is there's the injury and recovery related factors. So things like chronic pain, um, prolonged recovery. So we saw that in one of the earlier case examples where, um, you know, things may not take as little time as expected. And when things, timeframes blow out, people get sad, depressed, frustrated, loss of physical function, medication side effects, surgery complications, original workplace incident that caused the injury. So there may have been a traumatic event that the person's, you know, having flashbacks or dreaming about, as we saw in the second example. Suitable duties may not be available. So the person may be feeling frustrated or vulnerable or feeling like they're no longer wanted. Um, passive rather than active treatment from providers. So that means we will often see where people say, oh, I love going to a physio. They just give me a whole heap of massage. And that's not really a proactive way of helping that injured worker get back to work. There's a time and a place that we need to start seeing a more proactive form of treatment. There's also predisposing risk factors, things that are like a pre-existing mental illness, poor general health, financial stress, lack of support network, personal relationships and previous workplace grievances. And some of these might become even more important if that worker 
is from a you know in a remote area or they live alone so again being aware that this might be going on for your injured worker and then there's claim related factors things like frustration with the claim process perception of fairness and not being believed and lack of communication so what we want to be looking out for and it's important that we all are having a role to play the same as what we all need to be aware of you know keeping one another safe in the workplace. The same goes for looking out for people's mental health. Now, we're not saying everyone has to be an expert in this area, but it's really looking at what are some of the signs? Are, are we seeing a difference or a change in behaviour or communication for that worker? And then being able to have that discussion with them and just a bit of a chat of how are you, what is going on for you? Looking at things that might indicate that there is declining mental health, uh, reluctancy to leave their home. So they might come up with more and more excuses of can't come in today, can I work from home? And if that starts to be more and more of a trend, having that discussion with a person. And if you can't get them into the workplace looking at, well, potentially we could get them for, you know, a cup of tea or a coffee off-site potentially, but just try to work out what's going on for that person. Lack of communication and engagement in their recovery. So they might start missing appointments. They're not talking to work cover, their claims manager. They start to really start, um, isolate. Loss of drive or motivation. You start to see them seeming like they're tired of everything. Anxiety about or around returning to work and re-injury. And remembering that it's often a very scary time for an injured worker to be coming back into the workplace because they themselves know they're not able to do what they were doing before the injury. They might still be recovering. And so this whole notion that, you know, the expectation is that you are going to recover whilst you're at work rather than we're going to pop you right back into the workplace and expect that you do what you could do prior. And they also need to feel valued when they're coming back into the workplace. That's really important. Um, sleeplessness, we often hear that there's sleep issues with so many of our workers, and that will obviously impact on their ability to get up on time, get into work and be, you know, alert and, and be able to do their job. Becoming increasingly pain focused, that, that's a trend that we often see that every little bit of tweak or twang, they'll start to think it's something that it may not be. So there's that catastrophizing that might start to happen. Irritability and anger towards others, and that's often because of frustration and a sense of injustice or mistrust of the process. Because oftentimes we're asking workers to justify what they're doing, how they're doing. So they're feeling that they need to constantly be that sick person or that injured person. So they'll go above and beyond to try and show that, you know, I need to be validated. I really am you know, injured and I am recovering. So what can employers do to help um, at-risk workers? So the worker, the injured worker really does need to have a good relationship with their employer. This is a really key item to maintaining that communication. We find that workers that retain communication with their employer or their workplace have a much better chance of getting back to work. Even if the injury um, is quite severe, you will see if that contact is maintained, we, we do get them back a lot faster. So if we're looking at early intervention, if an employer supports their worker immediately in the right way, they are more likely to recover quickly and be able to get back to work safely, which in turn can lead to a better claim outcome. So what that's saying is, not being afraid to pick up the phone and have a discussion with that worker straight away. We often find that the you know there may be people feeling um, guilty for being injured. They might also have employers feeling bad that someone's been injured on their work or in their workplace, and that communication might stop. If you can just have that communication quite soon and try and retain that normality of of communication, that will go a long way. The best early intervention methods are to make contact quickly, as I've mentioned, and preferably over the phone or in person. So it needs to be personalised. The way you used to communicate with that person should not change once they've been injured. It sounds like a really simple concept, but you would be surprised how many times this becomes the biggest barrier to going back to work. So the other thing to think about is there are a lot of resources on the work cover website. So there's some links there and if you go to the um, employer return to work guide, you'll see that that's a really handy resource with a lot of really good tips and tricks for employers that might not be sure of what to say and how to say it. 
it's really important to be able to hear the worker. You're not necessarily saying I agree or disagree with you, just hear their story and that goes a long way. If the worker feels that they have been heard and that they are still valued despite being injured, they are more likely to want to come back to work sooner. Open and regular communication is what we've been speaking about. So it's really a, one of the keys to successful recovery and return to work is that open and regular communication with the worker through the claims process. And it's important whether or not you think the worker is at risk of developing a secondary mental injury, keep that contact open and those communication channels open regardless. And it also allows them, because we know that the system's not a great system and there will be times where they will be frustrated. If they can feel that they've got supports there, they will, again, be more inclined to wanting to come back to work sooner. When communicating with a worker, it's important to show empathy and care through active listening, offering support where available and asking questions to understand what they need and saying things like, I hear what you're saying, it must be difficult for you or that sounds really hard or that sounds, um, you know, like it's quite distressing. All of those types of discussions and communication are really helpful for the worker to start feeling that, oh, someone does still care even though I am injured. It's also essential to ask the worker how they would like to be contacted because we may think the easiest way or the way that they prefer is, you know, via text when in actual fact they may prefer to have that communication because you may be the only person they're speaking to whilst they're off work. So you want to be asking them how they want to be contacted and how often so that you can feel connected with them. If they say to you, no, I don't want to be contacted at all, that's a sign of there's a concern there and you can try and work your way around it so that you do at least have weekly, I would say, communication with your injured worker at worst. So again, for some tips on having a mental health conversation with a worker, have a look at the Safe Work Australia Conversation Guide and Return to Work Dealing with a Distressed Worker webpage. And again, those links I'm assuming will be sent through on the, the presentation and you'll be able to find your way there or just Google it. So again, it's important to remember that your workers will feel a loss of control when they come into this system because they've been injured and now they're reliant on someone to pay them to see you know different training professionals. They still need to feel like they have some sense of control and that's why we will ask them what is their preference for communication um, and anything else that you think might be important for them. Okay. Training staff to identify risks and communicate effectively. Again, we know that workplaces have become more and more aware of mental health issues these days, and we don't expect everyone to be an expert. But what we're saying is if you can look out for changes in your workers, this is where you might find that they will need some extra support. So what you want to remember is to either, if you're a manager or if you've got managers sitting under you, that you are all being able to be aware that you've got a worker coming back into the workplace or they're about to identify and being able to know how to consistently deal with identifying signs of declining mental health and how to approach and discuss these concerns with a worker. And again, people find it quite difficult to have those discussions, but sometimes if we just normalise it and you say, let's go grab a cup of coffee or whatever it may be, and say, talk me through how's it all going. This is quite a, you know, quite the process you're going through. How are you coping? Really simple communication and language tends to do the trick. It's also key for staff to be aware of the support pathways available for workers if they're feeling distressed, including those that are available through the workplace, such as your employee assistance programs, or you might have something else within that people and culture department. And also looking at um, what other additional supports they can get through work cover. And again, speaking to the work cover rep in terms of what may be able to be offered to your workers. Again, more information's on um, available for this on the website with mental injuries web the webpage and the mentally healthy workplace toolkit. That offers a practical, um, it's a practical resource with tools in there that ma employers, managers and leaders can use to create and maintain mentally healthy workplaces. But again, if you can just ensure that you're speaking with the person, not being afraid to have those discussions with them, you will find that that will go a long, long way. Okay, over to you, Michelle. 
Thank you, Tatiana. That was great. I suppose a couple of takeaways as I'm listening to uh, what you're sharing with us as well is um, this period, mental injury claims, whilst they can be more and more prevalent, they're, they're shrouded in some uncertainty um, and a bit of the unknown, but that goes for the worker and for the employer. And I think key to what you've said is that uh, an opportunity for employers is to really support their frontline leaders to know their people know their staff. So they already have those uh, open lines of communication and that you know your people well enough so that if you start to see behaviour changes, you can lean into those types of conversation and basically be checking, are you okay? Uh, within work cover, you know, when I'm doing training with our new people, our customer advisors, as an example, I'm not telling them that you, you, know, you need to have these conversations from the lens of a psychologist or a mental health social worker. We have those providers out there that can deliver those skills. But what you want to be able to do is listen to people, demonstrate empathy and compassion and support them to access support because you're not the expert. Um, but if you can show them that they can talk to you uh, without fear of judgment without fear of stigma and that you just want to support their well-being, then that's really a step in, in the right direction. All right, so offering suitable duties uh, is I cannot undersell how important suitable duties, the return to work phase, the readiness for return to work transition is important for people's recovery um, and well-being. So for offering suitable duties, employers can provide, employers can provide workers with a sense of purpose and value, uh, really getting back to that pre-injury state. Uh, we also know that going back to work, even if it's an alternative duties, can increase the prospects of a sustainable and earlier recovery. Helping to get injured worker back to work sooner can also lead to lower claims costs, which can turn, um, which in turn may help to reduce an employer's premium. And I tell you, I, I to this day I recall a story, a presentation where I sat in with a group of plaintiff solicitors. So solicitors at a common law stage who represent workers. And I think the, the question had gone to the, um, had come to them from the audience about, oh, you know, uh, what is it that work covers want, uh, workers want when they're, you know, coming to see you about their, their work cover claim? You know, obviously they're trying to common law, trying to gain common law uh, entitlements, you know, um, how do they present? And, and this plaintiff solicitor had said, oh, well, I never have workers come to my office uh, saying they want to lodge a common law claim. And we're all very perplexed, thinking, but that's what you do. You proceed common law claims for, uh, for, for workers. And they say, no, no, I have workers come to my office. And they say, I've been injured at work um, and, and no one's contacted me. Or I've been injured at work and I'm un, I'm, I'm, um, my job stability is uncertain. Or I've been injured at work and I haven't been part of the discussions about even returning to work. Uh, or I've been injured at work and I have a focus on treatment, but I, I feel like I'm a bit isolated by my employer and they're not consulting with me. And the plaintiff solicitor had said, um, you know, had relayed that they'd said to this worker, well, I can't really do anything about that, but what we can do is, you know, proceed with what your entitlements might be in a common law claim. And in that moment, I just had such a takeaway about, uh, about what was so important to workers during this time of recovery and the prospect of return to work. And the communication that employers have is an opportunity to engage early, to consult, to be flexible with what return to work might look like. Because in my experience with um, supporting frontline teams manage claims and returning to work, sometimes it's just getting that worker's foot back in the door. Because the biggest hurdle is that unknown of maybe I've been off work for three months or six months and I've been very unwell. How am I going to be received back at work? What's how am I, you know, what's my reputation uh, back at work? So sometimes just doing whatever you can with the doctor's approval that's a safe return to work to get someone back to work is important. So I've gone off on a tangent already, haven't I? Anyway, back to the slide. But those are those stories I find, I hope. Um, can reach some of the employers who might be listening, thinking, you know, what are what are those factors at play that really make a difference? And I remember that that story often comes to mind. So suitable duties should be both meaningful and suited to a worker's physical, psychological, and cognitive capabilities or capacities. And planning these duties together with the worker, treating provider, and work cover will keep everyone 
on that same page. Again, it reduces the unknown, it reduces the uncertainty and the fear for workers who are taking a big leap of faith once they've been unwell and they're returning to the workplace. Lots of information across our shared website um, on suitable duties and certainly resources around the employer return to work guide, as was mentioned earlier, look at suitable duties programs and templates, job task analysis as well. Right, so now we're going to um, quite play a quick video. I thought I'd get uh, get modern and relive my youth, so I got an e-scooter to commute to work on, uh, save a bit of fuel and have some fun on the way. And it's a, a lovely ride from my place into the shop. On the day of the incident, uh, I was just riding along, going uh, uphill, having a nice casual ride, and uh, my feet disappeared from under me and uh, slapped into the ground very, very hard. Hit my head, hit my shoulder, hit my back. There was no blood to speak of, only a slight little rash on my arm. There was no other impact. Uh, so I thought that I'd got away with it. Uh, investigations and scans and x-rays and things revealed uh, that I broke my back, I broke my shoulder, and I had 10 breaks in seven ribs. Stayed in hospital for 10 days, then at home for two and a half months, sitting upright in a chair, propped up by pillows because I couldn't move. Been about three or four months since I got out of the chair, and I'm more or less recovered now, more or less, <laughs> 95%. hospital referred my case to WorkCover. Uh, they worked very closely um, with, with my employer and with me and uh, the, the, the lady that was assigned to me was absolutely wonderful. She herself is an e-scooter rider so she understood what was going on in my mind <laughs> and uh, she worked with me to achieve the outcomes required. She was wonderful, very supportive, very understanding, very efficient. Susan assisted to an amazing extent, just kept me uh, mentally healthy as well as uh, looked after my, my income needs, made sure the paperwork kept my uh, income coming, uh, covered my medicals, filled in forms for me to make sure that all my costs uh, were being processed efficiently and it was uh, a major relief to get that out of the way without having to worry about it. I've been a modeler all my life so I wanted to get back into the hobby store uh, and uh, participate in that and get my life back on schedule again. So there was a lot of, uh, a lot of support and uh, communication facilitated by work cover to make sure that I was uh, mentally and physically uh, willing and able to get back in there and that my employer was uh, similarly uh, willing and able to get me back in there and at the earliest possibility which I think was around about the four or five month mark I was back at work and uh, working again now to the same capacity that I was previously. I see a lot of people riding scooters without helmets and uh, if I had not had a helmet on I would be dead. So wear the safety gear, ride slowly, enjoy the scooter, don't race the scooter, just enjoy it. Just look at the trees, look at the environment around you, be observant of the environment, enjoy it and uh, relax on the scooter. It's not a speed machine, it's a, it's a device for low speed entertainment. for watching the story with about Richard with us. So now we're just going to outline a few resources that are available for employers, workers, stakeholders, providers across uh, the WorkCover uh, website. Um, and I think there's a theme here around um, a real proactive approach to early intervention. Um, we are talking about secondary mental injuries today and, and, and secondary mental injuries means that, uh, look, you know, earlier to some of Tatiana's points, we have some insights to possibly control or mitigate secondary mental injuries occurring as opposed to perhaps primary mental injuries. So the opportunity here is much greater and the lens that a lot of this documentation and work cover uh, resources take um, comes from that lens. So there's a mental injuries uh, web page where it's got tools and resources and conversations guides. There's the Safe Work Australia conversation guide that can help you to manage the relationship with an ill or injured worker including a worker with a mental injury. Safe Work Australia, I can give a call out. Um, it's a great website. They also have a lot of research, research articles about symptomology of, um, of mental injuries, um, stigma in the workplace, raising awareness, reducing stigma. Um, so if, if something like mental health literacy in your workplace is part of 
uh, what you want to focus as part of a business plan or to improve your culture. Um, so that resource is really good for supporting education around mental health literacy across your workforce. Uh, return to work and dealing with distressed employees, the do's and don'ts, uh, the mentally healthy workplaces toolkit uh, that offers practical tools and resources for employers, managers and leaders to create and maintain mentally healthy workplaces. Of course, across the, the website, you will also see the um, the new uh, Managing Psychosocial Hazard Code of Practice that came out in April of this year, and that resource in particular supports employees with that implementation. Uh, there's also a webinar around developing suitable duties to support a worker with psychological injury um, from a regulator and a webinar on practical strategies to help employers work with all parties to return um, a worker to work from a primary and a mental injury. And as we mentioned before, this information will be part of what's sent out uh, to people who registered for the webinar. All right, so next, what can work cover do to help prevent uh, these injuries? Now, we're just talking about prevention. The image to the right always makes me think of an ecosystem. And in fact, sometimes within work cover, that's how we refer to our approach to managing uh, these types of claims or supporting the ecosystem that these workers are within. Um, so we have the worker, work cover, the employer, the medical and allied health provider, all focused on that recovery and return to work, but from that biopsychosocial lens. So work cover can assist in the prevention of secondary mental injuries by liaising directly with the worker and the treating team to understand the worker's capacity for work, the limitations or restrictions in any workplace concerns, and then communicate this important information with the employer. Now, certainly from time to time, there's opportunity for employers to be part of that conversation as well. And this may be particularly helpful if the employer has not been given um, a written authority, but if you have, um, the more inclusive, the better the outcome typically. The organising case conferences between the work of the employer, work cover and the treating healthcare providers to discuss any mental health concerns and barriers to recovery and to work out solutions together. What are the strategies we can focus on? And I think that can become really clear when we have that ecosystem all working um, in unison together um, because when we sort of don't work together, um, more so individually, people might get bogged down in, in the problem and the impact of the problem. And really what we want to be able to influence, influence within work cover is a solution-focused uh, perspective. Those key elements of transparency, collaboration and a focus on positive return to work outcomes are really those guiding lights. Okay. So how can work cover help? Work cover can assist the prevention of secondary mental injuries by helping to plan suitable duties, which may include uh, engaging a return to work provider to help identify the suitable duties and develop a plan, sharing resources um, in the process, including employee return to work guides, the suitable duties templates, job task analyses, the different roles. Um, it's often a good point um, and around return to work in all different alternate roles, particularly for mental injury claims, primary or secondary. They can be a strategy for work hardening or supporting someone's readiness to return to their pre-injury role if that is the goal for that particular worker and their claim. Liaising between parties to ensure duties are meaningful and tailored uh, to the needs of a worker is really important and making sure that everyone is open to being flexible where we might need to adjust or pivot on a suitable duties program with the doctor's approval to ensure it is actually tailored for the worker's recovery as well. Right, continuing with the help from work cover. Work cover can assist in the prevention of secondary mental injuries by referring at-risk at workers avail to available support. So as you might be aware, um, there were some sort of changes earlier. Um, see now that was actually a couple of years ago now where we provide early psychological support for new claims with a primary mental injury. Um, but for some time now, even predating that, uh, where work cover, and much as Tatiana spoke to with employers earlier being alert to signs of change in someone's behaviour, 
When work cover managing claims and perhaps noting that noticing that workers are struggling to cope or there's been behaviour change, uh, we will let them know that they can access um, some adjustment to injury counselling. They can do that with a psychologist or through a discussion with their GP. Um, but we can help um, by aiding those referrals or just letting workers know what their entitlements actually are. Um, we can also help with the mediation services between a worker and their employer. We don't see that too much in terms of a request, but certainly something that we can, can look at where an employer might think that's um, going to support or aid an outcome. I mentioned there, as we've said before, about adjustment to injury counselling. That's something that work cover uh, really promotes to ensure that we are intervening early with someone's recovery. So rather than waiting perhaps till someone's become quite unwell or incapacitated or perhaps hoping that they just get over that hump, um, intervening early we know is one of the better predictors for ensuring a sustainable return to work outcome. And I think I'm handing over to Tatiana now. You are. Thank you. Thank okay, you. so... One of the other things that WorkCover can do is also um, refer out to a workplace rehabilitation provider. So there is a whole panel of providers that work alongside WorkCover Queensland. And this can be for a range of uh, services. And these can be for services such as identifying suitable duties and developing a plan or to assist the worker with additional support, such as home care assistance. Um, so we were all on a panel with WorkCover. We know what the expectations and service delivery, and we tend to know how to work well within the system, um, workers' comp system. And some of the services that providers can offer are workplace evaluation or assessment. So it's usually known as a worksite assessment. And this is um, where the workplace rehab provider will come out to the work site. It's beneficial to have the worker there. We always encourage that having collaboration with the worker as well as the employer or the manager that works with that employer. And what we do is we complete an assessment or an evaluation of the workplace to identify appropriate duties for that worker in terms of what did they do before the injury? What are their current restrictions? And what aspects of their role can they still do? What can they retain? Because what we want to do is we want to be having people, whilst they're um, recovering, that they're recovering back in the workplace. Now, the workplace rehab provider obviously needs the input from the employer as well. We are not going to be recommending that somebody come back to work if it's not a safe time for them. However, there's also opportunities to look at, well, they only may be able to do a, a portion of their role, but we've got these other tasks and discussing those in the worksite assessment as well, because what you want to do is if you've got a worker that is fit to come back to work 12 hours or 18 hours or 30 hours a week with restrictions, that you can be having them back in the workplace doing something. Um, the other thing that we do after we've done a worksite assessment is a suitable duties plan or a program. And what that looks at is what is the upgrading process for this worker? So we've got them at this particular level now and we've done the worksite assessment and we've determined that they could do these certain duties and tasks. And based on their medical certification, they can work these hours and there might be lifting, pushing, pulling limitations. So you put that all together and you'll have stage one. And typically what happens is that the workplace rehab provider will list out all the different stages of proposed upgrades up to the point that person is going back to work in their full-time role doing or in their substantive role doing what their substantive tasks are. This goes to the GP, this goes to all the stakeholders so that everybody knows what is the proposed plan. The job seeking skills assessment is another way of identifying what are the transferable skills to a new job or career or to assist in finding a host placement. So sometimes the worker can't come back to their substantive role. The injury that they've sustained um, is one that physically they can't do and there might be a reason psychologically if there's an accepted psychological claim, um, secondary psychological claim. So what we want to look at is what are the identifying transferable skills for that person? What can they do? Is there something within that workplace that they could possibly be doing in an alternate role? We also have job preparation services. So that's career counselling and job search prep, which may include interview preparation and practice, job seeking skills and resume writing. We've got the job placement service for new employers. So if you've got an injured worker and it's quite clear that they can't come back to their substantive role quite early on, 
then you'd be looking at engaging a rehabilitation provider to help with new employer services. So they will actively source and place a worker in a new employment, and that includes durable recover at work placements. And we've got something that we call host placements, and that's a really good opportunity for the worker to try a different type of role with a new employer and see if they can sustain it. And it offers that supported environment where the rehab provider is involved and they can mediate any discussions or um, good, bad and otherwise situations that arise whilst that person's on that host. We've got job placement services or work hardening. And this is where the rehabilitation provider actively sources and places a worker in an appropriate temporary job placement where the current employer is unable to provide appropriate duties for the worker. And that could be temporary recovery at work placements, such as the host placements that I've just mentioned. At times, we will do a vocational assessment. So this is more comprehensive than the transferable skills assessment. So if the person has to be completely um I guess, rehoused in in employment in a completely different field, we will look at a comprehensive evaluation of their job potential, identification of realistic vocational options in the current job market or environment. And that includes looking at what does the labour market have in terms of those types of jobs. So there's no point in saying they can be a florist when there's no florist positions and they've not got the, the skills or the abilities to do something like that. There's also a functional capacity evaluation or an FCE. This is an assessment where the worker's functional capacity for work or potential to return to suitable work, where the information isn't available through other means, is um, done. It's typically um, the rehabilitation providers, whether it be OT, physio, um, that will do this assessment and they will run them through a series of tasks to determine what are their capacities. So lifting, pushing, pulling, can they climb stairs, can they not climb stairs, and what other limitations there might be. And then we also have the monitoring of suitable duties program, which is when the rehabilitation provider will communicate with all stakeholders to let everybody know what's going on, how they're progressing. They may also um, liaise with the GP in terms of if there's any hiccups along the way, but The suitable duties plan will be part of this where if the person's progressing to the next level, they're upgrading or they're doing a lot better than expected, then that gets done in this monitoring of suitable duties. And the pre-rehab provider will, like I say, communicate with all parties so that everybody knows what's happening. But it's also a good opportunity for employers to have an additional support for that injured worker so that if there is something that's going on and they might not feel comfortable having that discussion for whatever reason, they can use the rehab provider or work cover claims person um, as an additional support. Um, So again, you can see there that if there's um, more information that you'd like, work cover can provide by visiting the mental injuries and return to work webpage or by reaching out directly to your work cover relationship manager if you've got one or the person that's managing the claim. That's always a good um, opportunity as well. So um, they will typically know what the situation is with the worker as well as your business. Next slide. And this is back to Michelle. Thank you, Tatiana. So we're getting towards the end of the the webinar and we're going to touch on secondary mental injuries in workers' compensation and specifically how they're handled because I know um, that can be a hot topic in an area of curiosity for customers. So when we identify signs of poor coping or changes in behaviour or distress, remember we're talking secondary mental injury, so we already have a, a claim for a physical um, injury on foot, uh, we'll outline the support available to workers, including their ability to access adjustment to injury counselling by a registered provider. Um, work cover will typically talk to that provider to understand how that person is progressing and also circle back with any information to the GP. If a secondary mental injury has been documented, then on a, on a work capacity or a medical certificate from any doctor, either treating or independent, um, and it relates to uh, the compensable event or the, the claim, then we need to explore a liability decision to either accept or decline that new injury or diagnosis on the claim. And in doing that, work up as a usual determination process apply or considering that person is a worker, Um, that there's been an injury, that their current symptoms or injury is related to that workplace event. 
and we included communicating with the providers and allowing them and the employee the opportunity to provide a comment or information as we would do in any other determination of liability. If the secondary mental injury um, is deemed compensable as it relates to the physical injury or the original event, Work cover, contact the employer and allow them the opportunity to request a reasons for decision if they so wish, um, if they want to have that decision in particular reviewed with our regulator. So that's the end of our um, prepared slides and now we're going to go into some questions. Um, and I think Tatiana and both and I are going to um, have a go at these questions. And the first one is, what is the number one tip you would give an employer to assist them in supporting an employee with a mental injury? What a fabulous question. Um, I'm usually very obedient, but in this case, I can't stick to just one tip. Um, but what you've heard today, um, the focus on communication, good communication, communication that comes from someone who means something to that person in the workplace. So having a allocating um, ongoing communication with someone who's struggling to cope with their injury and perhaps showing signs of unwell, that communication from the employee needs to be with someone who they have an existing or a trusting relationship with. That can reduce that worker's fear and increase their certainty and feeling of safety about their recovery in the workplace. So please don't underestimate the power of ongoing communication. Communication is overlaid with empathy and compassion. Um, employers keep good records, keep good records of your communication, of the support that you offer, of the steps that you're taking to engage with a worker, the support structures that you're putting in place. Um, whilst we're talking about a best practice approach, common law claims exist and that was, might be where a claim actually progresses and record keeping is really good friend for you to ensure you can demonstrate how you've tried to support a worker and mitigate um, the hardship on them. Um, a, a document that was published early in the, in the year was called um, It Pays to Care by the Royal Australian College of Phys Physicians. And one of the takeaways I had from that document, believe it or not, is some of the research finds that an employer for a worker can have a more impact on their success or recovery than a doctor. So employees don't underestimate the opportunity you have to really navigate the claims process and um, influence a positive outcome to someone's recovery. And the other thing I would say is that anyone listening today is probably already on board with mental health literacy and the journey um, of trying to support workers in the workplace. So if I had one ask of the audience, it was would be tell a friend. Maybe tell a friend in your workplace or in another workplace about what best practice support for workers recovering from mental injury looks like. Tatiana, what can you share with us? Um, I think the only other thing I'd add to everything that you've just said, which is awesome, is that the worker also needs to feel that you're working with them, not you don't talk at them, you talk with them. I know that sounds really basic, but what we have found is if they feel like they're part of this whole process and that they've still retained some level of control, then it also goes a long way. Um, it's that whole perceived injustice that you want to avoid because that then opens up for, you know, protracted return to work or not coming back to work. The legal side tends to be more prominent. So it's really just, you know, being able to say to the worker and, not, and trying to normalise those communications um, in that, are you, you know, are you comfortable with this? What are your thoughts on this? Whilst you might still drive that discussion down the path you need it to go, but you're at least asking for their input. Thanks, Tatiana. I think what I take away from that too is focus on what's in your circle of control. There's lots of things that are going to be outside of an employer's circle of control, but understand the things that you can control or influence and focus in on those. Uh, the next question is, is early intervention, for example, ongoing contact with employees proven to reduce the number of secondary mental injury injuries for injured workers. Um, it certainly is, and there's a lot of emerging research in this space. I mentioned earlier about the It Pays to Care document. If anyone has time to, it's a little bit lengthy, but it's a fantastic read, um, as I mentioned before, put together by the Royal Australasian College of Physicians. Um, prior to that, one of the, the documents that they uh, 
produced were the health benefits of good work, which also talks to early communication and intervention. Um, so certainly early intervention we know um, is, is a key to or a key predictor within those uh, predictive factors of what's going to support a worker's recovery. So we know we have scheme factors, individual factors, workplace factors, injury factors, and that certainly plays um, a factor. Tadiana, got anything you wanted to add to that? No, I think it's, um, it again, it feels like we're saying the same thing over and over. The sooner you have communication, the sooner you have support. And sometimes if you see that the worker's behaviour is changing and work cover has got, you know, the opportunity for them to catch up with someone to discuss just their adjustment to injury, they may only need one or two sessions, which may then be a really good thing long term because they then have dealt and processed what they're going through. So sometimes the workers need assistance in sitting with where they're at because no one likes to be injured, no one likes to be, you know, on the receiving end of workers' comp, but they need to process those thoughts, feelings, experiences. And if you can get that happening earlier on, even for those workers that may not be keen, they go, I don't need it it often will be of benefit to them. You're not going to open up a can of worms and discuss everything that happened in their childhood. That is specifically just looking at how are they adjusting to where they are right now and helping them process and move through that, you know, that place that they're sitting at and might be a little bit stuck. Thank you so much. I think I'm mindful of the time and I think we've got two questions to go, so I'm happy to take the lead on those. Um, I've noticed terminology change from psychological injury to mental injury. Is there a particular reason for this change? Great question as well. Psychological and psychiatric, they're not the wrong terms. They're still in the workers' compensation legislation. But certainly across the literature and research, the terminology is transitioning from psychological, psychiatric to mental injury. It's really looking at the trying to, to show that what we're talking about here is health. And sometimes you have physical health and we're sometimes we're talking about um, mental health. And I appreciate the mental part can be a bit jarring for people, um, but if, you know, as we've seen on work cover, the more familiar you get with talking about it in those terms, the greater clarity you can sometimes have and see that it is reducing the stigma because we're trying to understand, you know, what type of health we're talking about. Also, the WHO, the World Health Organisation, certainly refers to these types of injuries and particularly in the workplace as mental injury. Our next question, or our last one, is if the workers, if the worker raises concerns about the management bullying them and not supporting them during the return to work process, a significant contributing factors to a mental injury, would you assess this as a secondary mental injury or a new claim? Also, a great question, perhaps one that um, needs a bit more discovery. But, yeah, no, it's a very own webinar. Um, but look, in any claim. What we look at as causative for an injury is the guidance we get from the doctor. So the medical expert, we look at what um, the doctor is saying is causative. Are they saying it's maybe the original work event that caused the physical injury? Or are they saying, actually, no, what's brought about this diagnosis or symptomology? Are these other events that have happened um, that perhaps are separate to the event? But we will also need to give consideration as to how those events are linked. You know, is the bullying as a direct injury, you know, as an example, is a direct consequence of or related to the workplace event that brought on the physical injury. So a, a, a very layered question there, but work covers determination approach, you know, those five steps around work event, injury and the like, um, certainly come into play when we're determining a secondary mental injury as well. All right. Uh, key takeaways. Top three. No surprise, contacting the worker early to offer your support and continue regular communication, showing empathy and care. Where possible, always providing the worker with meaningful, suitable duties to assist recovery and to help them feel valued as part of their recovery journey. And of course, reaching out to work cover. We are here to support you and your worker through this process. Our customer advisors are, are trained and do this sorts of work day in and day out, and they want to be able to see um, you know, a worker recover. We want to see you as customers and policyholders thrive and learn in this workspace as well. So thank you everyone. Um, for joining us on the webinar today. That's all we have. I uh, appreciate you coming along and taking the time to join us. 
If you're interested in attending more of our webinars, please keep an eye out for your email, LinkedIn and events pages on the WorkSafe uh, website. Thank you.